<clears throat> turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. We'll continue on. As I stated, um, we're going to go ahead and continue on on our lesson, which we started this morning. This morning, we started a lesson entitled Recognizing the Lord's un, uh, Unique Church. The Lord's Unique Church. And we went ahead and we've um, as we started this lesson, there were some handouts in the back. I, I invite you, if you haven't gotten one of those handouts, please take one of those handouts with you. Um, it just has all of the, the uh, uh, verses, all of the, the, the outline, um, both for this morning's lesson as well as this evening's lesson. And I invite you to take those and, and look at them, study those on your own. And if you have a question, if you have some issue or if you have something that you want to talk about, please let me know after services. I would uh, love to go ahead and look in the scriptures and ensure that we are all doing the things that the Lord has asked, us, asked of us to do. And uh, today's topic is extremely important. We, are, we need to know this. We need to understand what we are talking about when we talk about the Lord's church. So um, looking back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, just a, as a manner of, of review, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 here, Christ has gone ahead. He asked Peter exactly who he thought he was. And Peter responds that he is Christ, the, the son of the living God. And, and here Peter goes ahead and makes that confession. Christ goes ahead and commends Peter for, for understanding this and then says on this rock, that specific confession, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And here we went ahead and we already looked at some things. So just briefly kind of touching on the things that we've talked about. We talked about, well, it's important to understand what Christ is saying when he says upon this rock, upon this, uh, upon this confession, I will build my church. What is the church? How do I identify the church? How do I know that I'm, I'm following the right church? What, what am I supposed to be doing? What is it supposed to look like? What is Christ talking about during these things? And we said we understood what he was not talking about. We said that the, the, the church is not the building itself. It is not the Ephesus, or I'm sorry, the... Uh, um, the structure itself, it is the people. It isn't a thing, it is people. And we said it isn't a denomination, a religion. It isn't how we hear some people say, what, what church do you go to? It's not a denomination. And we have to be careful because sometimes we even fall into those same exact things. Sometimes we can start referring to the church of Christ as a denomination instead of being a description of what it is. So, um, and that's the first thing. We said it is not any of those. So then we talked about, well, what is it? It is the, it comes from the Greek word ekklesia. We saw that it essentially just means a called out assembly, church, or group, or congregation, and that this could be used in, in a couple of different ways. First, in a general sense, as we saw in Acts chapter 19, where we saw this group that had come and they took uh, uh, Paul's, uh, uh, his, his companions, and they were not religious in any way, uh, where they followed idolatry. But, but again, in the sense, they were just coming together. They were coming because they were upset. They, there was a group, a mob, if you would. And here they are uh, addressed as an assembly, which is that word that we see, ecclesia. The next thing we said, then, it, it, if we're talking about the general sense, we also talk about the, the religious sense. And we said that in the religious sense, all it is referring to is those that are saved through Christ, those that are called out through the gospel, and they are saved from the world, the world of sin. And we said that this can be seen in two different ways, both the universal sense as well as the local sense. Then we talk about the universal sense and all that is is just kind of lumping it all together and saying it's all of the saved, all of those who have come to Christ, uh, whether it's in the first century or it is in the 20th century. It does not matter, past or present. It doesn't matter what location they're at. They are a group, a body of Christ that has come together. That is in the universal sense. And it is spiritual in nature because we can't touch it. We can't feel it. There's no organization. There's, there's no solid foundation. There's no location that we can go to. All of those 
who have died, who are coming, and who are with us. All of those who are in Christ are part of that universal church, quote unquote. The next uh, um, we also talked about is the local sense. Now the local sense is a little bit different. Christ talks about these both in first one we talked about in Matthew 16, uh, 16, 18, where he says, upon this uh, rock, I will build my church. Well, that's the, the universal sense. And then he talked about the local sense, as he said, to bring it to the church. After um, you've tried to go to the person, you bring two or three witnesses, and then they still don't hear you bring it to the church. That's in the local sense. And we said, we see that in Ephesians, uh, when we're talking about the, the church at Ephesus, or when we talk about the church at Colossae, or uh, when we talk about the, the church at Rome, or even when we talk about today in our time, when we talk about um, this church that meets here at Crestway. It is talking about the local sense. It is then, uh, therefore, it is a, the body of Christ. Those who are in the body of Christ that are coming locally and they are doing the work of the Lord together as one unit. That is the local body, the local church. So then we, we said, well, that's fine and good. We understand that. Well, how do we understand what the church is? How, how do we know? How do, can we distinguish the church? Well, we can look and understand what the church is by looking at the unique governed uh, church as well as the fact that it is divinely designed. Now, what do I mean by that? We said that it is uniquely governed. It is governed by Christ. It is not a church that is governed by man or, or some person that is here or an organization. It is governed by Christ. So we understand that it is uniquely governed, it is, and Christ is the head of that church. And we saw that it is also referred to as the body of Christ. And that if he is ruling over that head as a king, that it is also the kingdom. And we also talked about that. And we said that he is, um, as he rules over the church, that he is also causing or call, calls for us to submit to him, to his authority. We must follow his his direction. We don't have the, the uh, leeway to do whatever we feel like. We must follow what he has asked of us. And therefore, those who accept that call, those who come into Christ, then also have the access into eternal uh, salvation. Now, at the same time, we also talked about that it, it was something that wasn't just a hodgepodge of stuff thrown together, that it didn't just happen, that Christ didn't say, hey, you know what, I, I, uh, since I'm, I'm not able to, to do what I, I was supposed to, which is set up the kingdom here and now, well, you know what, I'll just kind of throw together church. That's, that's not what we see. As a matter of fact, we looked in Ecclesia, um, not Ecclesia, into, into Ephesus. Turn with me to Ephesus, uh, not Ephesus, to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. Now, I've got Ephesus on my mind. So, <laughs> turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, we are told a couple of things about the church. We're told that, uh, one, it is the manifold wisdom of God, that the church itself is the manifold wisdom of God. It receives the word of the Lord. It follows the word of the Lord. It also holds up the word of the Lord. And then we see in verse 10 uh, or in verse 11 that this was accordance with the eternal purpose which God, he carried out through in Jesus our Lord. Here we see that it wasn't just something that was thrown together, but that God had an eternal purpose. It was designed and it was developed and established far beyond the time frame that man even was existence. Okay, so the last part that we talked about is that it is uniquely identified by a name. And we look at this and sometimes we, and we talked about how, okay, a name is important. And there is importance to a name, just as um, with my spouse, I have, she is, she carries my name. And we talked about, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go very well if, if a man went ahead and married a woman and the woman turned around and said, you know what, I don't want to carry your name, I will carry my ex-boyfriend's name. That's not going to go well. Okay, so same thing here. Christ goes ahead. He, his church carries his name. Now, we also looked at the fact that there are many names within the scriptures that the, that the Lord's church carries. It's not just one. We, we look outside and we see the church of Christ. We see that in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, where the church is referred to as the church of Christ. But we also just looked at Matthew 16, verse 18. 
And in Matthew 16, verse 18, Christ says, upon this church, uh, or upon this rock, I will build my church. That is Christ's church. So we see a different name that's being used. We looked at how Christ's church can also be referred to as the, the kingdom of God. Or the, it can be referred to as the, uh, God's, uh, um, God's household, uh, the household of God. And we saw all of these different ways that the church is identified. But with all of that being said, we see now, okay, we have it, it is governed and it is divinely designed. It has a unique and identified name, and, we, and all of these names are there. It doesn't give us the latitude to change those names. We must go ahead and flow with the names that are given to us within the scriptures. Now, all of that being said, what else do we see? Well, this is, brings us to the, the portion of our lesson where we are going to continue on in. See, the next part of this is the fact that the church is practicing and must practice in a specified worship. We look at this and from the beginning of time when we look at God, God has told man that man is to worship him. We see this in the very beginning when Cain and Abel went, went ahead, they sacrificed to the Lord. They are worshiping the Lord at that point. We see Abraham. Abraham sacrifices the Lord. He makes a covenant with the Lord. He is now going ahead and worshiping the Lord. We see that Moses goes ahead and tells the children of Israel, you are to do this and you are to worship in this manner. And those man, the manner in which they were supposed to worship the Lord was always specified. It was told exactly how they were to go ahead and worship. How they were supposed to go ahead and worship, not only how they were to worship, but what they were supposed to wear, how they were supposed to act, what they were supposed to do. All of those details were given to them. Well, what about us today? Do we have the opportunity to just go ahead and worship any which way that we feel like? We just do whatever we like because you know what? It, it, it suits us. No. Once again, we see that worship is always aimed towards God and it is always specified. The scriptures specify exactly how we are to worship. Christ specifically says in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 46, he goes ahead and he's talking here in, in Luke and he says, why do you call me Lord? He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, when we look at the Lord, we understand that we are to follow his word. We are to do what he asks of us. But that's not just in our lives. That is also in our worship. How we go ahead and worship the Lord is designated. It is dictated by the Lord. So therefore, we must, as the church, do and teach and practice exactly what the Lord has asked of us. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says something very important to us. He says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. In the, all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father, uh, the Father through him. This applies to everything in our lives. We understand that we are doing all things in the name of the Lord, regardless of what we're doing, but especially when we are in his worship service. When we are worshiping the Lord, we are doing all things in the name of the Lord. Now, what does that mean to say, I am doing all things in the name of the Lord? I am doing all things in his authority. And therefore, I must have authority for what I am doing. I cannot go ahead and just decide to do anything however I feel like, because I do not have authority to do those things. Remember, Christ said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? But those who do the will of my Father. And then he said that there were going to be many who are going to say to me, Lord, didn't we do all of these things? Didn't we do prophesy in your name? Didn't we do all of these things? And he says, I never knew you. Well, why didn't he know them? He didn't know them because they were doing things. And although they were doing things, they were not doing it in his authority. They were not doing it by his name. Look with me in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Here, Paul goes ahead and tells Timothy something very important. He goes ahead and he says uh, that he is coming to, to Timothy in verse 14. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to come to you before long. But in verse 15, he says, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how you, one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. And then he says, which 
is the church of the living God the pillar and the support of truth? So what does that tell us there? That gives us a unique feature of the church. It tells us two specific things. First of all, we have a way that we're supposed to conduct ourselves in the household of God. In his body, we are supposed to act and do a specific thing for him. But the second thing it also tells us is that church, that body that is meeting, must do so in support of the truth. Well, what truth is it? Who are we talking about? What are we talking about? Is it the truth that we see online? Is it the truth that we hear in the news? Is it the truth that my sister or my brother or my father or my mother tell me? What truth are we talking about? The truth that we're talking about is the truth that is in the scriptures. The truth that has been already revealed to us. Christ says specifically, I am the truth and the way and the life. Everyone and anybody who wants to go and flow into, the, the, uh, into salvation must go through Christ Amen. and must follow the truth, must go through the things that have been given to us. In 2 Timothy, look at, uh, over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, just a few pages over, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, Paul goes ahead and says this. He says, But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That is the truth that we're following. That is what we need to go ahead and essentially not only follow practice, but also as a church, we're supposed to be supporting. We're supposed to be supporting that pillar of truth. Now, when we look at that and we understand that, then it tells us something else. It tells us that if we are doing anything in Jesus' name, it must be under his authority. And therefore, it must be done in a specific way, in spirit and in truth. You see, John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 tells us specifically that all who are coming to Christ, all who are worshiping Christ must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, when we look at that and we hear that and we see that and we say, well, how, how do I worship in spirit and truth? Well, first of all, we have the Holy Spirit that guides us. That's the Holy Spirit has his written word here. But also we're told to love God with all our heart, mind and soul, our spirit. We are to love God with everything that we have, every fiber of our being. But also, he says, in truth. Again, it must be through the scriptures. We must follow. When we hear that, that terminology or that phrase that, it, that we say, we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where this Bible's silent. What does that mean? It means that we go ahead and look to the doctrine, the, we look to the Bible, we look to the scriptures to ensure that we are following what Christ has asked of us. And if we are not, if it doesn't say it here, if it doesn't go ahead and ask of us, then we shouldn't be inserting it. Now, with that being said, what are those works or acts of worship that we find within the church? See, there is five acts of worship that are discussed within the, in, in the, the Lord's body, in his, uh, his church. The first one we find is singing. Now, as if you haven't noticed, uh, you haven't been paying attention. We don't have any instruments up here. There are no specific things. Why is that? Because in Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, we're told specifically that we are to, to talk to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with our heart to the Lord. We are told not only what we're supposed to be doing in worship, that it is part of our worship, but also how we are supposed to do it. Making melody with our hearts. We are singing to the Lord. Now, some people might look at that and say, well, I, I like music. I like music too. But who am I worshiping? I'm not worshiping me. I'm not going ahead and doing it for you. I'm worshiping the Lord. 
I must follow what the Lord has asked, and He has prescribed a specific way in which we are to go ahead and worship Him. And that is the way that we do it. The second thing that we see is praying. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, look at what we are told about the first century church. See, they give us a great outline, a great kind of blueprint of what that church should be doing. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see that they have just been baptized. In verse 41, so they rose and received his word. They accepted the word. They were baptized. And on that day, they were added 3,000 souls. They were added to the Lord's body. And then what they were doing. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Here we see the prayer is going ahead and it is set as not something that we do kind of often. The, the, no, it is part of our worship. It is an important part of our worship. It is the communication that we have with the Lord. So when we go ahead and pray, well, how do we pray? Christ, remember he was asked by his disciples, how do you pray? We look at this, look in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. Here, Christ going ahead and he receives that, that question from his, apostle, uh, from his apostles, his, his uh, disciples. He goes ahead and they ask him, teach us how to pray in, verse, uh, in chapter 11, verse 1. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as, uh, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now, when we look at that and we see that, a lot of times you may go ahead and find people who take this verse right here, these verses, and that is how they pray and that's how they pray alone. But that's not what we see through the scriptures. Through, we, through the scriptures, we see countless amounts of prayers being given to the Lord constantly. We can look to the Psalms. We see, we see prayers um, being given throughout the Psalms. We can look throughout the Old Testament, New Testament. We can find all of these prayers being offered and they aren't verbatim. Why? Because it's supposed to be a prayer to the Lord, going ahead and asking the Lord for something specific. Now, it also tells us uh, it, there's a way we pray. You see, who am I praying? Who's the object of my prayer? The object of my prayer is not you and it isn't me. The object of my prayer is the Lord. I'm going ahead and I'm asking, I'm calling on the Lord, I'm asking him for prayers and supplications to help me through whatever trial I am, and then also praising the Father for what he has done for me. We must understand that when we pray, it is praying to the Lord. We are coming to his feet and asking for him to be with us. But also we see teaching. Now that's just a fancy word phrase saying preaching. Right? We either teaching or preaching in Acts chapter 20. Look with me there in Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, here we see Paul going ahead. He's about to go to Troas. And he goes ahead in Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 7. We're told on the first day of the week, when they were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. Now, I know you love to hear me speak, and I guarantee you want to hear me till midnight. Although I will not go ahead and hurt you in that manner. I still look at the scriptures and we see that the Lord has given us word. We see through the scriptures that preaching, teaching the word is important. Paul goes through the synagogue, synagogue after synagogue. He goes to a uh, different location after different location. They met and the, the Christians came together and they learned about the Lord. Paul, we're not told exactly what the message was that Paul gave us, but what was the message that he's been preaching up to this point? He's been preaching the kingdom. He's been preaching Christ crucified. He's been preaching all things and what you're supposed to do in Christ as a body of Christ. And here... He gives this message. But we're also told that he came together on that first day of the week and did something very special. They broke bread. Now, we may use that word and sometimes talk about breaking bread as in having a meal together. But here it is talking about this time that they come together. They are worshiping the Lord in that time on that first day of the week. And they are coming to break bread. They are coming to partake of the Lord's Supper, which we will do this, after, uh, this evening later on. So when we come to the Lord's Supper, we are told specifically that the Lord's Church goes ahead and partakes of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Well, why do we do that? 
In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 and on, here Christ goes ahead and establishes the Lord's Supper. He tells the disciples, go ahead and do this in memory of me. To go ahead and partake of the fruit of the vine, to partake of this unleavened bread, and to go ahead and remember his death. But we look at that and we say, well, that was to the disciples. That was to the apostles. Yes, it was. But we see it carried forward. We see it also. We just read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they were breaking bread. We now read here in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that they were breaking bread on the first day of the week. Well, how about in, uh, in 1 Corinthians? Look with me in 1 Corinthians. We read this often, but I think sometimes we go through it so fast that we don't really kind of see the gravity of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, we sometimes finish there. And we say, okay, that's, that's it. But there's a continuation. He continues the thought. And the thought is, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Why do we center on the Lord's death? Because we're asked to. We're told that is the memorial we're supposed to be doing. And then we're told, therefore, see, there's more. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. We're now told the manner in which we're supposed to go ahead and partake of this Lord's Supper. It isn't just go ahead and take of the Lord's Supper and just kind of drift off into some other land. It is remembering and understanding what you're doing, understanding the gravity of it, and then going ahead and partaking in it and looking and examining yourself to make sure you're doing it correctly. But also, we see the collection. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. We read this often as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, we're told about the collection that is done on the first day of the week. Here we told, uh, Paul goes ahead and gives instructions to the church there, uh, uh, just as he did also in Galatia. And he says in verse 2, on the first day of, each, uh, of every week, each one of you is to put aside uh, and save as he has purposed so that no collections be made when I come. And then we understand when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, how and what manner we're supposed to do that in. That it again, it is in something just where just kind of throwing in there and not having no thought of, but there is a purpose for it. Now, why do I bring all of these up? Because this is the prescribed worship that is called for in the scriptures. And if we go to a, 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 a body, uh, we go to a church, an assembly, and they are not practicing these things in the manner that Christ has already, then they cannot be the Lord's church. They cannot be the church that the Lord is talking about. Again, I am not talking about the church that meets here at Crestway. See, the church that meets here at Crestway is no different than every church that's out there. The church that meets here at Crestway needs to go ahead and bounce what they are doing in accordance to the Scripture. And when we look at the Scripture and we see the Lord's church... And if we are following those things that the Lord has given to us and that show his church, then we are part of that body. We are following his word. We are leaning on his will and we are accepting, submitting, or we are submitting to him. But the minute that we don't, it does not matter what the name is out there. It doesn't matter if we're doing some or all of the pieces of worship. If we're not doing it in the manner that the Lord has asked of us, then we are vainly worshiping. We are doing things that are not prescribed, and therefore we cannot call ourselves a part of the Lord's body. Now, these, when you look at these, you look at these five acts of worship, some may look at that and say, well, that's, I understand all of these, but that's quite a few. That's, that's not very many. I do a whole lot more worship than this. 
And I would beg to differ. You see, these are acts of worship. There is a difference between acts of worship and acts of service. Acts of service are things that I do, whether it's helping my, my spouse or going ahead and helping a brother or sister in need or going ahead and assisting somebody that is needy. Those are acts of service. Those are fruits of the Spirit. That's not worship. The worship that we see here is the worship that is given to us through the Scriptures. We must not go ahead and just assume everything I do is worship to the Lord. It is service to the Lord but is in worship to the Lord. Why do I say that? Because brethren, we gotta be careful. Because if everything is worship, then anything is worship. You see, we are told specifically how to worship the Lord. When the Lord wrote in the Old Testament and told them what to do and how to act and what to, he gave them the blueprint and said, this is worship, this is what I want from you. He expected them to do it as is, not to add in their own flavor, but to just do it the way that he wanted. We must also do the same exact thing. See, God has prescribed for us through his written word exactly what we are supposed to be doing. And it brings me to understand. Let's go to the Old Testament. You see, in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 3, what happened to Nadab and Abihu? Do you remember Nadab and Abihu? How they go ahead and they were worshiping the Lord. And in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, let's go ahead and read that really quick. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. We're told, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pens and putting fire in them, placed incense on it and, and offered strange fire before the Lord and he had not, that he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke. By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. Here, God tells them, You are delivering something that I had not prescribed. Now, we don't understand what that strange fire is. But it was obviously something that the Lord had already commanded them to do specifically, and they just took it upon themselves to change it, for whatever reason that is. And God punished them for it. And then God tells them, you come to me to worship when you come to me, understand that I am holy, and you need to worship me in the way and the manner I've asked. Now, we look at that and we say, well, that's the Old Testament. That doesn't really apply to us today, does it? Well, let's look at that. Look at 1 Peter. Turn with me to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, beginning in, uh, we'll go in verse 14. Beginning in verse 14. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, Peter writes this. He says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were, in, uh, which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you to be uh, called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behaviors, because I, it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Now go with me to verse uh, uh, chapter 2. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, and uh, just verses, uh, we'll go 4 and 5. Here we're told about us, the church, and he says, And coming to him as living stones, that is each and every one of us, as living stones which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood uh, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So here we're called, not only are we living stones, but we are called this holy priesthood and we're supposed to be giving a sacrifice, no different than Aaron and his sons were doing. And then look in verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into that marvelous light. Here we see that as priests, we're supposed to be doing something, but it all 
reflects the Lord's words. We must, as his priests, be abiding by the word that he has given to us. Therefore, any church that is failing to conduct the worship in the manner that the Lord has given and is going ahead and putting some different things out there, some uh, prescribed other things that they just choose to do, I tell you right now, they cannot be saying that they are part of the Lord's church. That isn't from me. That is from the scriptures. So the last part of this is how do we become part of the Lord's church then? How do we become, how do we enter into the Lord's church? In Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, Paul writes this. He says, he says that God has transferred us, or he, he has given us access into his inheritance and rescued us from darkness. And he says that God has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God has transferred us into the kingdom. Well, by now, hopefully, you've clearly understood that there is only one church. One church that Christ has built, one that rules over all things, one that is in one body and one head of that body. And that the church is the, the body that Christ has given his life for, that he purchased with his blood. So then, how do I become part of that church? Turn with me again to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, we're told specifically how this happens. First, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Paul, uh, Peter has already just given to them exactly. They have asked, men and brethren, what should we do? We understand we have crucified the Son of the living God, and he, they ask, what should they do? And Peter says to them, repent, each one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on, and we are told then in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So those who had received his word were baptized, and on that day were added 3,000 souls. And then in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us something very important. First of all, we, you and I, do not add anybody into the church. The Lord adds to the church. And we must understand that when we come into Christ, when we accept Christ, when we go ahead and accept his gospel call, then we are added into the church wherever we are, wherever the location is, whatever time frame it is, we are added into the Lord's body. You know, Paul said, uh, talking about those that were causing division, he said, I planted Apollos water, but God caused the increase. We need to understand we, you and I, do not have authority to add someone into the Lord's body. All we do is help them to come to Christ. He adds them into the body. But in the same, same uh, way of thinking, we have to understand that those who are coming into the Lord's body must receive his word. They must accept the word that has been given to us, the gospel that has been given to them. Just as we already read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, the gospel goes ahead and takes us out of the sin of the world. Also, we're told in Romans chapter 10, verses uh, 13 through 15, that we, when we receive that word, when we go ahead and hear that word, that we believe and that belief is, causes us to come to Christ. In, in Romans chapter 10, and I'll just go ahead and read this. Romans chapter 10, for whoever called on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will, how then will they be, how, how will, excuse me, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. And then in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We must accept the word, the gospel call. We must accept Christ. And then we need to submit to him. We must go ahead and understand that he is the king. We must submit our, ourselves to Christ. 
give him authority over our lives. And then we're told we need to repent. In Romans chapter 10, right where we're at, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, what, what are we told there? We're told, if you confess with your mouth, mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We need to confess Christ. But also in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they were told specifically, you need to repent and be baptized. You need to have a repentant heart, a repentant life, a change of your life, and you need to be baptized. Well, some may say, well, uh, why do I need to be baptized? Is it really necessary for me to be baptized? In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, we're told specifically, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We're also told in 1 Peter, and this will be our last verse for today. Go ahead and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, uh, beginning in verse 18, when it comes to baptism and the importance of baptism, we're told this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. We're told, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in, verse, I'm in chapter 2. Uh, chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also died for sin once for all, the just, for the just and the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been, having been put to death in the flesh, but may, made alive in the spirit in which he also, he also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Uh, and then in verse, uh, uh, going into verse 20, who were once disobedient, or uh, he's, he's talking about those that were in prison, who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting on, in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved safely through the water. Corresponding to that, corresponding to Noah and the flood, he says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, we need baptism because baptism saves us. It cleanses us, not from the filth of the, the flesh, but it cleanses our souls. It is for the remission of our sins, for the cleansing of our souls. There are many who will reject this, who will reject how to be added into the Lord's body and will refuse to accept entrance into the kingdom of God, into his church. Why? Because they look at it and they say, I don't need to do all of that. I just want to do it my way. There's no need for me to do it that way. And sadly, just like Naaman, who was told to go and dip in the Jordan, if they do not do those things, if they fail to do those things, if they resist that, then they will remain in their sins and they cannot be added into the body until they change. I pray that this lesson was helpful for you. I pray that this lesson helps you in your walk and helps you in identifying the Lord's church. And it was beneficial for you as we talk about the unique church that Christ built, because it was a unique church, but it was an identifiable church. And we need to know that it is God's church. It is his command. It is his rule that we must follow and we must fall in. So the question that I ask you, are you part of Christ's unique church? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you gone ahead and confessed him and then repented of your sins, been baptized for the remission of your sins, and then now walk in the newness of life? If you haven't done those things, if you haven't accepted the call the way that the body asks, that the way that the Lord asks for the body to do, then you have the opportunity to do so today. But if you're one who has, not accept, or has already accepted and look at your life and needs the prayers of the saints or needs help of the saints in any which way, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.